Well, if you've been keeping up, we've been talking about 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter on love. And like after tonight, love is done. It's over. We will not be loving anymore in this church. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, so this is kind of like the grand finale, I guess, the ending of this, at least this um, section of the study on what love is, what love looks like, and how we can maybe practice love is what we're trying to look at, as opposed to saying, well, I think I'm loving and, you know, you need to be more loving. So it's nice to have a little bit more specific what this means and what this looks like. And maybe today is maybe just as challenging as any time uh, any of the other lessons on what love is, patient, kind, and, you know, just these other qualities that are very important and how we treat people and our attitude and things like that. Uh, very good. So we want to talk about this love always, uh, which is there in verse 7. And again, depending on what the translation is, um, and I appreciate uh, Glenn reading from the, the King James because that does say it a little different way. So this is like the... Um, the ESV, which is very similar to New King James and King James and things like that. So um, it says, love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and endures all things. And so that's kind of one way of putting it. But the, the NIV, which is the, the Bible a lot of times we use because it's in our pews, um, that says it a little bit differently. So it says love... So again, this is what we just read. So we'll compare that with this, this next section with the blue, which is the NIV. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So that's kind of why we got the lesson of the title uh, for, for tonight. Uh, the lesson title is, you know, love always. It, so love is consistent. Love continues to have the right kind of attitude no matter what happens, no matter how it's accepted, no matter how people respond, no matter how we're feeling on that day. Love is consistent in the attitudes that it has. So... Uh, we do want to talk about that. But the, the interesting thing is, um, you know, when I went to India, they were always using uh, somebody to take what I said in English and put it into the Telugu language so they could understand. So they had to correct me a couple times because sometimes I say, oh, are you translating for me today? And they would say, no, no, I'm not going to translate for you. I'm going to interpret and so there's a difference, right? Because translating is them trying to figure out exactly what I'm saying, kind of word for word, and, and explaining it that way. And that probably wouldn't go over very well. So they have to take what I say in English and think, how would I say this so that people here could understand? Like, I'm trying to take what Peter means, which is difficult because a lot of times I don't even know what I mean. But, you know, I say it, and they're trying to think, well, how can I say this that the people here will understand? You know, so it's interesting the way it came out sometimes, because sometimes I would say something um, kind of short. You know, I may just say, well, you know, it was never quite this simple, but something like, Jesus loves you. And the guy would go on and on. It's like, <laughs> you're adding something, buddy. I mean, that's not, come on, man. I'm just, you know. And other times it would like, you know, I'd say quite a long sentence, and he would just be like, da da da. And I'm like, how, how could you have said everything I just said in, you know, three words, you know, so, but, you know, he had to do the best he could in trying to take one language and to convey it so that the people can get a sense in their own language and custom and culture of what this really means. And so that's, you know, to be fair, that's what all interpreters, you know, serious Bible scholars or some people that have not written in, uh, you know, uh, uh, a translation of the Bible. You know, translation means that they go back to the original. Um, but uh, the people that have done it, what they're trying to do is to convey it in a, in a language that we would understand today. Okay? So that's kind of why these sound a little bit differently. But, uh, so let me explain the first one here. The first one that says, love bears all things and love always protects. And you say, boy, that doesn't sound familiar. They don't sound similar. That, like, they sound like completely different topics. Like, how could they be so different? And they, they've all come from, from a, Greek, uh, a Greek statement. Well, the Greek statement is kind of something like, um, uh, and I'll explain what this verse means in 1 Corinthians 6. It has to do with a covering, a covering. 
And, and the best way that they would, you know, if you looked up the Greek word, what it would mean is like when somebody covers something over, and they may say it's like a roof. You know, when you've got a roof, it covers you over. So what does the roof do? Well, it protects you maybe from the sun. It protects you from the rain. Um, you know, and maybe, you know, in our houses would hold some heat in. So it holds some things out, some, some things in and keeps some things from coming in. We don't want in. And so it's a protection. So that's kind of what the Greek word means. It's a covering. So if it bears all things, so what does a roof do? It's bearing you know, it's, it's keeping out, it's, you know, we'd say literally holding up, but it's, it's covering over, so it's protecting me. And then, so that's why love always protects. So, because a roof both bears over us and yet also protects us. And so that's kind of where you can kind of see, oh, so both of those do kind of apply to this Greek word. And so maybe it's helpful we have both of these translations, not necessarily uh, you know, and, and the interpretation as well, so that we can understand what, what this is trying to say. Well, the interesting thing is that this word, this word that, that the covering only comes up a, a couple of times in the New Testament, this Greek word, and one of it is, you know, would, why not, rat, this is back in 1 Corinthians 6, which maybe you could say would correlate, because it's the same letter he's writing, uh, why not rather be wronged, why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves, you yourselves cheat and do wrong and all this to your brothers and sisters. So the idea is, why wouldn't you rather be wronged? Why wouldn't you allow yourself to, uh, to endure that? Like, so you can kind of cover over. If somebody sinned against you, then maybe you can cover that over. Maybe you could bear that burden. Maybe you could tolerate that. You could put up with that. You could endure that for the sake of the relationship, for the sake of unity in the church, for the sake of love, right? So that's kind of how the same Greek, and you don't even see it in here, but it is the same Greek word, that we are willing to bear what somebody else has. And so in the Old Testament and the New Testament, both use this kind of language. So First Peter says, this is very clear, and this is the, the same Greek word as well, above all, love each other de deeply because love covers over, it's the covering over, the love uh, you know, is able to protect, it's able to endure, it's able to uh, help us through this situation. So this love covers over a multitude of sins. So maybe we don't always understand what that means or how we would apply that to our life. But certainly it has to do with being able to, we would say, overlook an offense. So again, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs, willing to cover over. And I think some of this perhaps may come, come into play with some of these other uh, things that he has in the list. It's they, you know, when you kind of look at them closely, it seems like they're, they're fairly uh, closely related. So you say, well, what, would, what would this covering over look like? What would that mean? If you really love somebody, you're willing to to cover over, you're, you're willing, and so some of these other words is, is, is trust and believe and, and think the best of the covering over. So how does somebody do that? How does a parent do that? If you ever notice, a lot of times parents are willing to give their children the benefit of the doubt. You know, somebody accuses a child of doing something. You know, they, 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 they didn't mean to do that. They didn't understand what they were, they, they didn't, you know, that was probably somebody else, or they were coerced, or that, this is just the first time they've done something. You know, so we always, sometimes we would say making excuses for them. Why? Because maybe we believe in them, or we want the best for them, and so somehow, because we love them, we maybe can't even comprehend them actually doing such a thing, right? So you ever know something like that? Do you know somebody who sometimes, we would even say make excuses for? That's kind of going a little bit too far, this way of covering over. But you ever know somebody that, that somebody you don't like and they do something wrong well you, you you don't cover that over you say they're always like that didn't surprise me at all that's just the type of person they are that's that's comes from their upbringing that comes because uh you know they always you know they always do this and they never do that right but generally you don't talk that way about people you love you are you're, you're willing to cover over so it's kind of like when someone sins, and it's kind of interesting, because what does, 
What does Jesus tell us to do when someone sins in Matthew 18? And I think we know it well enough. We don't have to do a whole study on it, but it shows us what cover over looks like. When someone sins against us, we go to that person in private and we try to reconcile, we try to rectify the problem. And if they have sinned, you know, we certainly want them to come to repentance. Why? Because we want the very best for them. And so we're willing to cover it over. And if, if we can come to that point where there's reconciliation, then what do we do? Well, we cover it over. But now if you don't like the person and they sin against you, what's the first thing? Human nature, perhaps you've known somebody that does this, is that we'd want to tell other people about it. I want to tell somebody, you know, what you did. So I'm, I'm going to go around and tell everybody your fault. You know, something that you've done. And I may not even have talked to you about it. So I'm not willing to cover it over. I'm not willing to, to bear it. You know, I'm, I, I want to expose it. And so one of the commentators kind of, you know, did a play on words, right? Instead of bearing the sin or bearing the fault and me willing to absorb, you know, even some of the, you know, the struggle I have or the, the attitude I could get from it. So I'm going to absorb the, uh, 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 absorb the problem and, and the difficulty and the challenge. So that would be um, covering, covering over, right? So that would be the idea of I will bear the burden. So that's B-E-A-R. But you can also spell bear, B-A-R-E, which means expose. Let everybody know, you know, kind of put you out in the open. Let everybody see your faults, right? So you have two choices. Either you can bear it or you can bear it, right? And so he's, he's saying, but, but love is, I want to cover, I want to protect you. I want to protect your reputation. I want to protect your, your character. I don't want to make this more difficult for you. Like I... You know, but that's opposite to the way our world is. Our world is very much into, if we can find the fault on somebody, especially if it's somebody who's, you know, a popular, uh, somebody who maybe is uh, well-known, right? And, and I know people would never print magazines like that and sell them in the front lines of the, uh, the supermarkets. I mean, who would buy that stuff, right? All we're doing is finding out all the trash on people that, you know, are celebrities so that we can feel better about ourselves, right? But that's, that's what he's saying. You see, love would not do that. Love would want the best for them, and love would be wanting to conceal what they're doing as opposed to making it public because we want to make things better for them. We want to make repentance easier. We, we want to lessen any kind of shame or uh, recourse. You know, we, we just, we, we want the best. And that's what love does. So that's the idea of, of love would be willing to cover it over. It's willing to protect it, willing to, to bear it so that that person would not need to be exposed. So some of the other things that love does, and like I say, some of these seem to be fairly closely intertwined, I think, anyway. Love believes all things. It believes. Or love always trusts, right? So when we can believe in somebody else or trust somebody. So this is especially when maybe somebody has made a mistake, right? And I know um, somebody just the other day was talking about, um, you know, sometimes in the, in the fields of uh, science and medicine and trying to help people and, and psychology and counseling, you know, sometimes there's two attitudes people can have, right? Well, you're an addict, and I know addicts, you know, once an addict, always an addict, you know, you're, you're never going to overcome this. You're always going to be an alcoholic. You're always going to have issues. You're always going to have problems. You're never going to be able to keep a job. Your family's always going to hate you. You know, just that whole thing as opposed to, so that's not believing in somebody. That's not saying, well, you know, you, you can overcome. You can have a better future. You know, things can, can, can look up, right? This is kind of like, well, you know, you'll always be that way as opposed to saying, Man, I know it's a struggle, but I, I believe in you. I think you can make it through. I think you can over... There's Lisa right there. I was talking about you, Lisa. I was looking for you. Not in your seat, Lisa. That, so Lisa is the one who was talking about, um, uh, you know, at work, sometimes people always look down on people and say, well, you, you'll never get better, right? 
well, how's that bringing hope to anybody? Because a lot of times it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But, but what, what do parents want to do with their children, right? You, you, you don't want to say, well, you're, no, you're always going to be lazy. You're always going to be a loser. You're never going to succeed in life. You, know? you don't want to say that to your children. You want to give them hope to say, hey, you know, you're struggling right now, but gee, you can get better grades. Uh, you know, you don't have a job right now, but something I'm sure is coming up right around the corner. So, you know, even there's, though they're struggling, you, you want to give them hope. Because why? You believe in their future, right? Now, yeah, they may have some growing to do, but maybe you want to help them through that growing. So this is what love does. It's not always down on people, but it's trying to lift people up and trying to encourage people that they would do better. So that's the kind of person Barnabas was, right, with Paul. Uh, you know, I was kind of looking for some scriptures that would tie this in, and there a lot, not many came to my mind, so maybe you've got a lot of others that come to your mind about people that were this way, but, you know, Paul became a Christian. Everybody's like, well, I don't know if I trust him. I don't know if he's believable. I don't know if he's up to something. I don't know if this is some kind of a plan that, you know, he's going to start persecuting us. He's, you know, maybe he's not even sincere about it. You know, maybe he's kind of one of these undercover imposters. Or something. So nobody really wanted to, uh, you know, to accept Paul and to, to maybe even associate with Paul. But Barnabas is like, well, he said he's a Christian, so what am I going to do? I'm going to believe in him. You know, I'll trust him. I will, you know, put my, my faith in, in what he says. He says he's a Christian. That's good enough for me. I'm going to accept him at face value and say, hey, I want to help you grow. I want to help you mature. I want to help you get strong in Christ. I, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, see you go back uh, into where you came from just because nobody in the church is encouraging you. So this is the kind of person Barnabas was, and probably the similar way with John Mark. You remember, he went on the first missionary journey, second missionary journey. Paul didn't really want to take him along, but Barnabas is like, well, yeah, he's made some mistakes, but I believe in him. Like, let, let's give him another chance, because I think he's going to do all right. Hey, he's grown from that, right? We don't need to hold this against him the rest of his life, so let's provide an opportunity. And so he's looking for the best. So he believes in somebody like Paul. He believes in somebody like John Mark to say, hey, the past is the past. Let's move on to the future and, and believe that things can indeed get better. Um, Jesus was the same way with Peter. You remember when uh, Peter uh, basically said, uh, you know, I'll never deny you. I, I will be faithful to you. And then Jesus says, well, you know, you're going to deny me. And then... Uh, um, but look what Jesus said. Jesus said, you know, I know what Satan wants to do in your life. And, and he didn't say, you know, but you're going to fail. And boy, I'm not sure about you, Peter. I don't even know if I can rely on you. Uh, I don't know what your future is going to be. But good luck, buddy. Like, uh, and, you know, we'll see you again sometime maybe. Right? He didn't say that. He said, you know, what he did say is when you have turned. Right? He didn't say if you've turned. He says, I, I, I know you. I know you're going to grow through this. It's going to be a low point in your life. But, you know, you're going you're gonna to make it through. You can get stronger. You're going to turn back to, to, to me, and, and you're going to be useful in the kingdom. And so he, he, what would we say? He believed in Peter, right? So he says, you know, I, I believe in you. I trust you. I, I'm, I'm going to, even now, knowing what you're going to do and denying me and turning from me, but I'm going to even give you a ministry right now that you can take with you even beyond that point. To say, you know, one day you're going to be both a, an apostle and a shepherd in the, in the church. And you're going to be leading people. And so that's good. And so I see Jesus having that attitude even in what he says to Peter. To try to lift him up and to give him some encouragement even through that challenging time in his own life. Well, so love always hopes. And so this is, you know, very similar in both of uh, uh, the older translation and the newer one about hoping. Uh, again, that... Uh, Similar to what we've already talked about, as far as I can see, is, you know, hoping for the future, hoping that this is going to work out. I, I'm, I'm hoping for the best in you. So, again, hope is not just some kind of a, um, a loose feeling. So quite often, it's the same word that is used in the Bible when we talk about our hope is in Christ, our hope is in the resurrection, our hope is God's going to be working through us, our hope's in the gospel. You know, all those words that we talk about hope, and sometimes we talk about faith being very similar to this hope. But this is the same word, but now it's kind of more of a hope in somebody else, a hope in somebody's future, and maybe they're not even there yet. And so Paul sometimes uses that when he talks about the Gentiles, and he's saying, you know, this is my hope. Why do I continue to do what I'm doing? So in Romans 11, um, he, he says, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, but, but I hope, my, my plan, my hope, my desire is when I'm preaching to the Gentiles, my own... Uh, 
uh, religious family, which is from Judaism, you know, my own people nationally, you know, I, I want them to turn to Christ. This is, this is my goal. This is my hope, right? And so he's not just kind of saying, well, it's wishful thinking, but he's saying, I really believe this can happen. I really believe this can make an impact. And maybe it did not make as much as a, an impact that Paul hoped or planned or wished it would make, but there were some, uh, some Gentiles that became Christians, but also some Jewish people became Christians. So this is what he's saying. I, you know, I'm doing this uh, with the plan that some of my own uh, countrymen would also become Christians. And he said the same thing uh, when he says, for this reason I came and talked to you, it's because of the hope of Israel. I'm bound in this chain. So he's saying, I'm preaching the gospel. Here I am imprisoned. I'm on trial because of my faith in Christ. But what, what, what is all that about? He's saying, well, I hope that through all of this, and I'm believing that through this, I think that's what Paul's saying, I'm believing that through the sufferings that I go through, some of the people of Israel will be saved. And so that's the, the kind of hope of looking forward to positively thinking that even in a negative si uh, situation or circumstances, so if love hopes through those kinds of situations and trials and difficulties, that that... Um, that's, that's where love is. Love is not just giving up on people. Love is saying, you know, there's still time. There's still more that can be done. And then the last thing he says, it endures or perseveres. Again, very similar words of enduring just means keeping on, not giving up and persevering. And, and again, that's what love does. Um, I mean, how many people here, and I know there's a few, you know, maybe many of us, you know, we have children that are not walking with Christ right now. Maybe at one time they were, and now they're not. Now, has anybody kind of said, yeah, my children aren't really walking with Christ. Um, I've just given up on them altogether. I don't think they ever will. Anybody think that way? I mean, even if you had, even if you had reason to believe that way, well, you probably wouldn't. You say, there's still hope. There's still time. I still believe that they can turn around. You know, they've maybe been gone a long time, but, you know, I'm, I'm hoping I've not given up. So I'm going to endure. I'm going to persevere. I'm not just going to say, well, you know, they've had, they've had a couple opportunities along the way and they, they didn't take the right road, so it's over, right? So what are we doing and why do we do that again? This is the point, because that's what love does, right? But now maybe people we don't know that well or maybe people we don't like that well, it's kind of like, well, you know, they've left the church, they've, got, they've been gone for like 35 minutes and we've given up on them. Well, they're never coming back, right? What's the problem there? Well, maybe we don't love them like we should. We don't, we don't think, hey, man, I am really anticipating that, hoping, but I'm also enduring. I've not given up on them. I've not given up thinking about them or praying about them or reaching out to them because love endures. So, so I think a lot of these qualities come when we're challenged. It's not, you know, when everything is just, you know, uh, going very well in a relationship, we say, well, you know, I've got love that hopes and endures and is steadfast and continues and covers, you know, that's that kind of love I have, you know. Well, anybody can have that kind of love, right, when things are going well, but it's through the times of adversity or difficulty or challenges, maybe days where we don't even feel like loving, because, you know, I think most of us are at that point in life that, you know, maybe except for the kids that are under 10 or something, you know, but even then, Maybe even kids sometimes don't feel like loving their brothers or sisters or their friends or whatever, but yeah, sometimes we don't feel like, but we continue to do the right thing because that's what love does. That's what love is. And so I think that's what Paul is trying to get to. Again, remembering who he's writing to, the auditorium class is studying 1 Corinthians 13 and maybe in about 15 weeks or something, maybe you'll get to chapter 13 and you can just say, you know, we, we can skip over the whole thing. Just kidding. Um, but you know, the fact is, it's written in a context of a lot of problems, and we've already seen them in the auditorium class Sunday mornings, a lot of problems that the Corinthian church is going through. And, you know, you look at their struggles uh, with each other, their struggles in their relationship with God, their struggles in their purity of worship, right? Their struggles with sin and worldliness. They had a lot of stuff going on. So what do they need? Well, they need love. And so that's kind of why I think he spent uh, this chapter in, in a book like 1 Corinthians 13, where 
the churches, we would say, uh, you know, out of all the churches you read about uh, in the New Testament, and this, certainly this is one of the longer books, but we would say this church seems, if I could use the word slang word, messed up more than any other churches we can read about. Some churches had problems, no doubt. But it's like, whatever problem you can ever think about or dream about, it seems like Corinth had it. Like, they have all the problems, right? And so it was kind of a very worldly church. And so part of the answer is what? To love God and to love each other. And it, that maybe that's why he spends this amount of time spending a whole chapter about love in a church that was really lacking love. And so maybe that's helpful for us as we go through our, our uh, relationships, whether people in the church, maybe in our own personal families, maybe in the workplace, wherever we are, how we ought to love people. Because Jesus, what, right, what did he say? Uh, that we need to love one another. Love one another. And so if we have, to, we have to know what love is and define love and make it very practical in order that we can love one another the way God wants us to love. So we're going to yeah, look at uh, this song we're going to sing about um, Do You Know My Jesus? Because Jesus is the one who does love us. He cares about us. And, and again, we could use Jesus as the illustration of what perfect love looks like because we know that God is love. Jesus is God. Jesus came and lived in this world, so the things Jesus did and said and the way he acted and reacted were all based in love because that's who Jesus is. He's a person of love, never a person of hate. Now, you can look at how he dealt with people that were in opposition to him, uh, false teachers, people that were even abusive to other people. So does that mean that he always talked really loving and kind? Well, no, sometimes he was pretty stern. But you know why he corrected people? And sometimes we may even look at like Matthew 23 and say, boy, that doesn't look like love. That seems a little bit mean. It seems harsh. Why would he do that? Well, he did it in a very loving way because sometimes you have to be harsh. So again, parents with children or maybe even a, a brother and sister in Christ, you've got to talk to somebody else and maybe eventually you just have to say, you know, I'm really concerned about your soul, but I need to, I need to speak very frankly here and tell you that, you know, I'm just not you know, giving you, uh, you know, a few suggestions about how you ought to live in order you can go to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, we need to be making some serious changes here. So it doesn't always look like love or come across like love, but, you know, correcting and discipline is also love. Because again, as a parent, if you never disciplined or corrected your children, as a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 12 would say, that's not love. If you never discipline, he says, what father would, would never discipline his own children? And he said, well, of course, a father loves his children, he will discipline. So, you know, that's what love is. That's why Jesus is love. Jesus came to show us God's love, and he came to help us to be loving people. So uh, we want to encourage you, if, if anybody needs the prayers and the encouragement of the church, if somebody wants to be baptized into Christ even tonight, um, and to accept the love that God has for us, and to be living in his love, um, we always uh, welcome uh, a response. So if we can encourage you tonight, let's stand, we'll sing this song and let us know how we can be a blessing.